This program is made possible by the National Endowment for the Arts with additional funding from the Maryland Humanities Council. <laughs> Linda Paston talks with Roland Flint. Welcome to The Writing Life. I'm Linda Paston, and I'm going to be speaking with Roland Flint, the Poet Laureate of Maryland. Roland is well known to much of this audience. He's not only read widely in Maryland and around the country, but until his recent retirement, has taught for many years at Georgetown University, where he's influenced a whole generation of readers and writers. He's also been on the teaching staffs of Warren Wilson College and the Bedloe Writers Conference. Um, his new book, Easy, just released from the Louisiana State University Press, is his seventh book of poetry, the one that we're going to be talking about and celebrating today. Roland, why don't you start by reading us the title poem, Easy. All right. I should be interviewing you. Linda's. Linda's last book was nominated for the National Book Award. We should be celebrating that. Thanks. Here is the title poem, Easy. While she starts the water and measures the pasta, he sets the table and peels the garlic. She cuts up broccoli, strips snow peas, readies fish. He presses the garlic, fixes her a kier, and him a gin. She sautés the vegetables while he grates cheese, readies the candles, and puts flowers on the table. She puts pasta in the boiling water and fixes salad, which he takes to the table with the cheese. She mixes a salad dressing. He opens the wine and takes it to the table where everything is ready except for the pasta. So he lights the candles and puts salad from a big walnut bowl into small ones. Now, she or he brings the pasta, greens and fish mixed in, and they sit to talk, drink wine, and eat. Though October, they sit on a small screen porch in the back of the house where they have lived for 12 years of their 20 together, the last six, the children gone, alone. Once during dinner, if they stop talking and listen to the music, they may, without drama, hold hands a moment, almost like a handshake by now, most friendly, confirming the contract and more. She is a pretty woman of 51 who has kept herself trim and fit. He is 56 and hasn't. Later they will clear the dishes and clean up, and she will bring tea and fresh fruit to bed, where they will watch a little television or not with the herbal tea and the fruit. After that, if they make love or not, they will talk a long time, her work or his, the budget, the Middle East, this child or that, how good dinner was, how easy it is, the times like this, when it's simple. In some ways, this is a quintessentially flint poem, a small narrative of simple homey details adding up to a picture of a whole life. And yet the ending, how easy it is, the times like this when it's simple, leaves us with a reverberation of all the other times when it isn't simple. That one line, in a sense, balancing the whole rest of the poem. Was this in your mind when you started, or did the poem take you there uh, unexpectedly? I, I think it must be the latter, because uh, I don't think I was thinking of it along the way. But, I, I, but I'm happy to hear you say that. It, uh, young people who hear it, I can tell from their responses or what they say to me afterward, think it must be about an ideal marriage, you know, whereas people with a little experience of marriage are more likely to see what you did, that it suggests not all the times are so easy right. as, uh, as this one, which makes, it, makes this occasion more precious, not less. Right. But uh, <clears throat> I think that it, uh, I think it is there at the end. And uh, I don't know when it came into the poem in the process, but I'm 
I wouldn't like it if it weren't there. Right. What made you have this the title poem? In fact, talk a little bit about your titles. They're very quirky um, and mourning and stubborn. They're different from other people's titles. Well, um, and mourning is a was my first book, as you know, and it's a it's it's a kind of pun. Uh, it, it, there's a little title poem about uh, the rooster rising, and uh, and it's also a book that ha is implicit with grief uh, of a specific kind. That is, the poems in it concern grief for someone lost, and so it is both things. It is uh, finding finding the will to go on in the face of grief, and it is the grief itself. And uh, Stubborn, you know, has as a title poem and as a central idea in the book a similar thing, that uh, Stubborn, which is usually taken to be not a very nice word, um, that is to signify something not very admirable, has good aspects, and one of them is the stubborn persistence of grief over the loss of ones we love. And there are other kinds of stubbornness that are admirable, too. But uh, it's interesting that... And then easy. Is that a <laughs> kind of relaxing from that, or is, the, is it for you very much the implication that's in the poem? Uh, it's very much the implication that's in the poem, that... Yeah. Uh, there are things to be grateful for, and and I think um, I think you know my poems as well as anyone. There are occasions of celebration in those other books too, right. uh, as there are in this one. And but the other thing is also, also always there. Do you feel that that this book is a departure in any way from your past books? Do you feel your voice changing? I had noticed that. Um, you, you've always written in what we might call broadly plain style, but it seems more pronounced here. There seem to me to be fewer metaphors and sort of flights of language as if it was a deliberate kind of paring down. Did you sense that? Um, now that you say it, I, I might have to say I understand what you mean, but no, it wasn't deliberate. Um, it was not deliberate. It was not easiness uh, of that kind, that is a relaxation of that kind. Though when you say it, it makes sense to me. Uh, that is, it makes sense as true of, of this book. Um, there's no long formal poem like Stubborn or Sicily, as in previous books. But there are, uh, there's a sonnet in this book, and there are other little sort of mm. rhyme bootlegged in, in the free verse, free verse poems. So uh, I, I would have to think about that. Uh, part of the easiness comes from that epigraph from James Wright in which um, he, he says, easy, easy, I ask you easy, metrical crystals of February, it is just snow. And, and his point is that it's about as easy to make a poem as it is to make a snowflake. Right. You know, uh, right. So um, I do think you may be you may be right about that. I have to think about it a little bit. Um, speaking of the the James Wright quote, there are poets who who appear in this book who I know have meant something to you in your life. William Stafford, um, as well as James Wright, Charles Simic, Robert Hayden. Um, do you feel that they their influences on your style, on your writing, or just poets whose work you love? I think more poets whose work I love. Um, Wright was a Wright was a big influence. I mean, Wright made a big dent in me when I first encountered him. I was a graduate student at the University of Minnesota, and he was on the staff there. And I, I hadn't met him. I didn't know he was there. I was subscribed to Poetry Magazine, and he had three or four poems in an issue. That's when I got connected with Wright. And uh, it's interesting because Wright put me on to Robert Hayden as he did to Thomas McGrath, a North Dakota poet I, I should have known about, um, <clears throat> and others too. He was a fountain of, <laughs> of uh, good poets and quotations. But 
I think mostly they're, they're poems I, I love. I, I, I admire and cherish uh, Simic very much. And that poem was in an issue of Gettysburg Review. Alas, immediately following an essay by Charles Simic. And I, it made me uneasy to think that was planned, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, a, a bad stack, but when, when I asked you um, whether you had planned the end of Easy, I wonder if you were influenced by Stafford's way of writing. I, I mean, his, his essays about writing, writing the Australian Crawl, for example, where he talks about following a poem to where it wants to take you and daring to, um, to listen to, you know, what the poem wants to do rather than what you want to do. I, I heard him talk about that more than once. Uh, sometimes with the metaphor of the uh, hunting dog that will <laughs> sniff. If the scent goes there, mm -hmm. he follows it there. And uh, I, I, I'm not aware of thinking of that while writing, though I was very taken with it when he said it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, I, and he said to me once, in Singapore, in fact, he said to me, I showed him a new poem. I think it was that poem, Stubborn. And he said, uh, I admire your faith in following the, where the poem wants mm -hmm. to go. Why don't you read us the little poem for Stafford? This is, uh, it's, it's, uh, this is the sonnet, actually. And um, I talked with Dorothy, Stafford's widow. I got the page wrong here. It's page, yes, OK. And she, uh, I had heard that his, da his last day was like this, that he'd done some writing. And, uh, and spent a quiet day, went for a jog, and uh, she called him to help her with something in the kitchen. And there he fell down and died. Um, and some of the references are two things he wrote about, an Apache word for love is from a poem mm -hmm. for his, and uh, something about dirt on the mole. Um, so there are a number of little things that uh, might be familiar to a Stafford reader. William, <clears throat> William Stafford's Last Day. I say it's a sonnet, but it has shorter lines than sonnets, and the s rhymes are all off rhymes or slant, or <clears throat> almost all. Up early to jog and write, alert for what might show, such as an Apache word for love, new dirt on the mole, a snowy pass. So careful and youthfully fit, we said he's a cinch for 90. He'd have been amused by that, knowing any time is plenty. His poem was done when Dorothy called, and he went to help her. So, if too soon for us, it was a worthy moment for his heart to go. For whatever epic after that, he was readier than we, no doubt. Wonderful poem. It, um, he was almost 80. You know, and all those things were true of him. He, was, he seemed always in great shape. He, he, didn't, he hardly drank. He, he never smoked. He was in excellent health and very fit. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I did think he might live to be 100. Incredible loss for all of us. Yes. Yeah. Beat the, the austere also, the Robert Hayden poem. I love the Robert Hayden <coughs> poem, and I love this poem. I do, too. And uh, <clears throat> Robert Hayden was, as many, many of you will know, the first African-American consultant in poetry at the Library of Congress, now called the uh, National Poet Laureate, or Laureateship. And it's from his famous poem, Those Winter Sundays, which ends, What Did I Know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? And this is about my mother, who had six kids in a drafty North Dakota farmhouse that had no running water or central heat or electricity. Austere. How, how she left kettles of water on the kitchen stove for baths each Saturday night till hotter than needed, add cold, to wash in the corrugated tub, 
the week's field dirt away, blown even into the crib from a North Dakota sky. As all of us take turns, the young mother renewing clean heat for each till it runs out as she's finishing hers. I offer you her kettles, stove, the kerosene lamp light, her palm, her soap, her olive, the tub, its velvety silt. There are a lot of people in these poems, a lot of names of, of people, and um, besides family members, it, it, it seems like a, a very peopled book, which, <laughs> which interested me a lot. It, there are also places here, and I wanted you to read um, some of the poems written in those various places, but first I wanted to ask you, does traveling help you to write? Do you write while you're there? Do you do it in retrospect after you get back? Well, I try. Um, I shouldn't say it now because I haven't been doing it just lately, but for most of my adult life, I've tried to write in my journal every day something. And when I'm traveling, I do more of that, or, or I do it more fully and uh, as faithfully as, as I ever have. And, uh, and poems do come out of it. Uh, I don't know. And so in that sense, I guess you would say the travel inspires or begets poems. But it's not very different from my usual process. The book is organized, though, to end with, to be a mixture all the way, but to end with poems that are more and more remote from where it starts, which is with childhood and poems about relationships between mm -hmm. children and adults. And it ends with poems about faraway places, um, mostly. Meet us a couple of those. I love particularly strawberries and raspberries. There's also a garden in Sicily. Those are strawberries two of my like raspberries. Strawberries like raspberries, yes. Um, I, was, I was once at the old dictator's White House in Sofia, Bulgaria. It's called Boyan. And it's, a, it's really a palace. And uh, there I had some of the best fruit I've ever had in my life. Of course, Bulgaria is a wonderful Reiska Gradina, they call it, garden paradise. And they have wonderful fruits and vegetables. But here, they, you know, just like, just as the, the best folk singing and dancing in Bulgaria you see in the president's company, um, here was the best fruit. And so that is true. And I heard after communism fell that they were having trouble with distribution. Stuff wasn't getting around. And people were going without, which seemed a terrible irony in such a rich country agriculturally. So that's saying too much about it, I suppose. But strawberries like raspberries. And then there was that incident where I, <laughs> where I misunderstood friends who said, these strawberries are so good, they're like raspberries. But they said it in Bulgarian, and I repeated it at the grocer the next day, Yagodi Katomalini, and the grocer thought I was crazy. I thought it was a variety of raspberries, really. <laughs> strawberries like raspberries. A few years ago in Bulgaria, in Boyana, outside Sofia, you had the best pear of your life, a Bosque, and then another. They had the highest pear taste, the chewiest sweetness, an apple snap of October, the genius or luck of Bulgarian horticulture, which has also given the best cherries, strawberries, and peaches of your life. The strawberries were small, a delicately sweet, dark red, and a friend called them in Bulgarian strawberries like raspberries, which you misunderstood, taking that to be a varietal name of this strawberry, that is, raspberrian strawberries. And the next day, shopping alone, you puzzled and amused the grocer, asking in your baby Bulgarian for Yagodi Katomalini, the strawberries like raspberries. In one of your Bulgarian reading lessons in the communist textbook, the country is called a garden paradise. And so it seemed, always, on many visits. But now you keep hearing and reading about the brutal shortages of transition, as if glasnost and apples can't break from the same blossoms 
as if the national white cheese, a finer feta from cows or goats, as if the velvet yogurt, even milk, even bread, even your favorite grape brandy are failing to find their mouths as the old systems of supply and distribution or of politics and privilege die by their own dead weight or from the freedom now to say so. As if for a while at least the harvest will be only of fruit bitterer than sour cherries of what had been more deeply sown. I'm going to ask you about a very different kind of poem. Monkey House seems to be a favorite of people at readings, and though it's very different in tone from, I think, almost all of the other poems in, in this book, it is in the tradition of your poems like Oysters, and it is kind of your boisterous side. And do these poems come at different times? Well, first tell me, is it one of your favorites? <laughs> Oysters is. This one is not one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that, of course. Well, um, they, they seem to come less often than they did. I, I think in the past I wrote many more of them. Um, this, this came, you know, this came as, as it says from this long history. I went to the Washington Zoo with my kids when I had three-year-old twins and a five-year-old daughter, and this thing happened. And I never thought of writing about it, really, for 25 years. And then I did, and I sat down and wrote this odd little prose poem, and uh, I will read it. Monkey House. For a while the three-year-old twins seem as interested as their father, but the five-year-old keeps tugging his hand. They've been looking at the black rhinos, and the father, leaning and squat, is absorbed in watching a lithe male trying to mount a thick, a big, thick cow who faces a carousel of hay, contentedly chewing. Heavy rains have left the ground a muddy gumbo wherever the rhinos have made paths, as especially all around the carousel. Twice in a row, the dignified cow oblivious, the bull has cranked his hooves and the horny anvil of his head up onto her back. The exposed pink and surprisingly pointed tip of his eagerness has been an inch from entering when his hind hooves begin to sink in the mud and he slides back down. After the second time, all three children are whining, let's go, daddy, let's go. Although the morning is cool, the man's face is hotly flushed. Just a minute, he explains, wait. A third time, the bull rises up until millimeters from pay dirt, his back legs trembling, the pointy hind hooves slowly sink and down he falls again. This time he pivots sharply and trots away, then stops short tenses and voids with great force, two rectangular turds in a row, like little hay bales, slap against the mud, whap, whap. In this, the children are interested. They shout, wow, and whap, whap, and point, and make delighted rillings of laughter. The father, looking down as if wakened, also begins to laugh, and they stroll away towards the monkey house. It's How interesting. Can I not love that poem. It's so <laughs> it's so Roland Flint. <laughs> but I, I I knew it wasn't your, one of your favorites, and it was mean of me to put you on the spot. But of course, that's why I did. And by the way, my daughters, who uh, who were children when they first heard the oyster poem, and always loved and still do the oyster poem, are less enthusiastic about this mm -hmm. one. By the way, good taste, your children. <laughs> um, we're. we're getting down towards the end, and I wanted to, um, well, there were many things I wanted to ask you. One was about the last poem in the book, Prayer. Um, all throughout your books, there are moments when you are thanking God for this thing or the other, and I wondered in what sense you think of yourself as being a religious person or a religious poet. Well, <clears throat> it's an interesting question even for me. I was religious as, uh, as a kid. I was an altar boy in the Episcopal Church, and I wanted, and I and I thought for a while I wanted to be a priest, an Episcopal priest, and um, and then a <laughs> a man who was about to be ordained said something mean to me, mean and judgmental. It was at a church camp, and 
and I had a church camp girlfriend, and we were very fond of each other and spent a lot of time together, and uh, I suppose often had our arms around each other, but it was entirely an innocent relationship. I was about 15, and he said something mean to me about that. And that <laughs> ended my interest in being a priest. I don't know what it did to my faith, but um, I, think, uh, I think I have uh, enormous respect for the possibility. I, I, I'm not a churchgoer or not a regular churchgoer, and uh, I don't think of myself as an Episcopalian anymore or a Christian, but, uh, but it's true I have begun in old age praying again. Why don't we end with that poem, because we just have a minute left. Okay. I say the Lord's Prayer, I say Hail Mary, I say the Jewish blessings on bread and wine in Hebrew. <laughs> I say a whole bunch of them when I say them. This is my real prayer. Any day's writing may be the last. He's reminded at two in the morning, making this year's last Italian notes before readying his machine and self to get aboard the bigger machine and fly Dio Volente home. And so he repeats the Our Father, he said to himself before rising, and feels a heartfelt thanks, Lord, for such poems as have come his way, whether or not they get read, and it goes without saying, few may. And thanks as well for eagerness, almost daily, to greet the drone with words bequeathed in part by what poets before have done. He prays to be among them one, however small, the work is all. That was a wonderful way to end. Thank you, Roland, for talking with me today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Writing Life. Well, okay. <laughs>